All right. Well, welcome tonight to the vice presidential debates. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, if you're at home, uh, turn that off and then watch this, and you can record that, and then you can watch that again later, and then you would have a better attitude while you watch it. So um, tonight, I just want to begin in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, just kind of what we're going to be doing tonight and looking at um, how do we live with grace and truth in a politically, um, like a, a divisive culture and a difficult culture. And so 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 says, Therefore I exert for, uh, exhort first of all that supplications and prayers and intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Let's pray. Lord, today we lift up to you um, our government leaders, and we pray for government leaders not only at the national level, but on the state and the local level. Lord, there are some that we agree with and some that we don't agree with, and you don't designate which ones we should pray for or not pray for. Lord, we ask that you would um, draw these people that serve uh, men and women in government towards you, that you would give wisdom that is good and fair and just and righteous. We pray for those that don't know you, that they would come to know who Christ is. And um, Lord, we also pray that you would help us in the world that we live in to be full of grace and truth. Jesus, you set that example for us. So tonight we ask that you would bless our time, and we pray that questions that are asked, Lord, uh, you tell us in your word that when we ask for wisdom, that we should believe, knowing that you hear us, that you'll, you'll give us wisdom. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, a few things. This will be our last Wednesday night Life Church for a while because what we're really wanting people to do, um, we've done this in the past where we, we take a break at times to really kind of focus on the life groups and Rooted because one of the areas where um, it's so important, even before 2020, before COVID-19, before political division and all these kinds of things that are going on that we see in our world, one of the greatest needs is for connection. It's for community. It's to know people and to be known, um, to be able to struggle and wrestle with things. And if you think that community is going to be perfect, just know it will not. Sometimes our ideal of what community is is higher than what community really is because community is real people. And there's no real people that are perfect, so your community will not be perfect. But to me, that's actually one of the ways that we see God's grace is that God brings people together and, and we don't want to be together where um, we all have to agree on everything. And all, also to realize that there's going to be times when we hurt one another, we say things wrong, and there's where repentance comes in and saying, I'm sorry. It's also where blind spots are revealed. In our culture, which we call it a cancel culture today, when someone disagrees with us, what we do is we just say, okay, unfriend, unfollow, I'm not gonna talk to you anymore. I'm gonna go to this place to find these friends. Oh, these are better friends, until there's a disagreement there and then bounce to another group of friends. So we don't wanna do that. Um, and so politics is something that I don't talk about very often um, as a topic, but because of the season that we're in, it's applicable because remember that um, if you were here on Sunday, Rob McCoy, when he was talking about the definition of politics, it's how we um, deal with one another socially and morally as a society and as a culture. So um, tonight, what I wanted to do is kind of re review a few things to find out if maybe there are a few questions online via Zoom or Facebook or live here and in person um, to respond to some of those and maybe look to scripture to see how we could wrestle with some of these things together. It's so important that we have conversations today because we're not finding that in our world. It's not conversation. It's yelling and it's shouting and it's like saying a point of view and then cutting the other person off. Uh, my friend Tim Brown, who pastors Calvary Chapel Fremont, had this great analogy. Do you guys ever watch Family Feud? If you ever watch Family Feud, 
you know, the, this is actually kind of like the, t- we should do that, like on a Sunday morning. One person comes from this side, another person comes from this side, you know, the, their hands are behind them, there's buzzers, and I read a question, and what happens is when they read the question, uh, Steve Harvey will say, okay, uh, we asked 100 people, um, what would you do if, and then someone buzzes before he finishes the question. And then what happens is they just stare at him and they have to give an answer before they heard it. And that is a great picture of what's happening in our culture today. You know, in in the Bible, it says that um, it's folly, it's foolishness to answer before you hear, before you know. And so we're, we're just like, everyone's buzzing without like listening to what the other side or the other person is saying. So remember that, when it comes to um, when it comes to unity, we we came from a time during fires where we had uh, like sixty people that were staying here. There were tents in here, campers out there, children's ministry filled with families. Um, it, it was just this time of people coming together. And what we saw is that at that time, no one was asking who are you voting for. Uh, people were feeding one another. Restaurants were giving us food, and it was just this thing of of just seeing people as they are. So I'm not saying that there won't be differences, but it was such a great breath. It was a pause in the middle of a crazy year, as crazy as it was and as hard as it was because we realized people lost their homes. There were people that were um, right on the verge of it. Some people did lose their homes, but we got to see a glimpse of the beautiful kingdom of God of people coming together to help out the community, even people outside of the church. So Sunday, we also talked about the word conflation. Uh, Conflation is a word, it's the process of uh, the result of fusing items into one entity or fusion, uh, an amalgamation. So things like, um, hey, if you are this, then you are also this. So if Here are just some examples of conflation in our culture right now. Not saying I'm saying these things. I'm saying these are things that people are saying. And by the way, I started off on Sunday saying, I I was going to say you might disagree with me on some of these things, but then I said, no, that's false. You will disagree with me on some of these things, and that's okay, because I'm learning too. And sometimes I disagree with myself. Sometimes I disagree with myself like next week and going back and going, yeah, you know, I'm not sure if I really think that. Not... Not on true things of the word of God, but even, but more so the application. So here are some examples of conflation. When people say that wearing a face covering, it means that you're being a sheep or you are being just fearful. When someone that is wearing a face covering is saying, if you're not wearing a face covering, then you don't care if you kill me. That's conflation. It's like, it, it's, it's really crazy. Or equating a Republican with racial insensitivity, as people sometimes will say that. Or if someone says blue lives matter, the conflation is that means that you're okay with police brutality. So when we say one thing, it doesn't mean that we have to take a whole bunch of other things that go along with it. Does that make sense? And when we conflate ideas and put them all together, it causes conflict and it causes division. Um, another thing is that, you know, people can say, well, uh, you, you must be a, a Republican to be a Christian, or you must be a Democrat. You can't vote for Trump and be a Christian. So we have both people. We have two camps of people saying, this is what it equates to be a Christian. So then we went into reductionism, the practice of oversimplifying a complex idea or issue, um, especially to the point of minimizing or obscuring or distorting it. Um, COVID death is, e- you know, COVID-19 is either death or it's nothing. Or, um, you know, taking down statues. Uh, some people say, well, that's taking down history. Other people saying it's taking down, you know, painful reminders. Uh, maybe it's some of both. So we, we kind of looked at focusing on this phrase. You can't be a Christian and vote for blank. And different people have different definitions of what you could vote for or not vote for. And, you know, I'm looking for that verse in the Bible still. Um, And I have not been able to find it about, like, vote this way to be a Christian. I I can't find it. What I do see is that Christians were disciples 
and disciples were students, learners. The word Christian only appears three times um, in, the, in the Gospels and in Acts, but uh, the word disciple appears 261 times. And so we looked at what a disciple is and how a disciple, um, we looked at Titus, that Jesus, it says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. So we can't say, I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm a Christian, because look at all of these good things that I've done. Uh, Ben sent me a video that I watched today that uh, I was talking uh, to him about it last night. I was over at Mount Hermon, and I saw him over there. And he said, yeah, there's this really, uh, really good video that is about um, transactional Christianity, transactional Christianity. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it on Sunday when we get into Galatians. But transactional Christianity is saying like, God, look at all of these good things that I've done, and therefore in the transaction, you must do something good for me. And if I'm trying my best and I'm doing all these good things and bad things happen, then you're not taking, you're not living up to your end of the bargain. And so when bad things happen, there are a lot of people that abandon their faith because they're saying, look at all of these good things that I've done. Instead of realizing that all of us fall short and all of us have messed up and we need grace and forgiveness. And it's really about what Jesus has done for us and being grateful and thankful. So transactional Christianity is really not Christianity at all. Um, He didn't save us because of good works that we've done or our righteousness, but it was according to his mercy by the washing, washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So notice it's through Christ and what he's done for us. It's almost like um, we were blessed on Sunday that uh, we went to go pay for our hot dogs and uh, Daniel, who is running the hot dog cart, said, oh, don't worry about it. Someone already paid. A little bit different because we don't know who it was, but when Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, that payment is meant to cause us to realize that, number one, he loves us. Number two, it's a payment that we couldn't pay. It's, a, it's a, a gift that is meant to cause relationship to happen. So that's what it means to be justified, to be set in good standing with God because of what Christ has done. That's what a Christian is. Therefore, we can't look at what someone does and say, oh, you did this, so that made you a Christian. Now, there are behaviors as Christians that we should follow. And I could say that's not Christ-like to slap that person in the face and take their wallet. That's not Christ-like. But if I don't do that and I'm a good person, that doesn't make me a Christian. So again, it, it goes back to reductionism and conflation. So with that, um, we, we just went through, our goal is to make disciples, uh, to nurture, to cultivate a community of disciples And so the battle is not against flesh and blood. We we battle against evil, but not um, we're not against people per se. So the early church was multi-ethnic and diverse in community. It was committed to caring for the poor, the foreigner, the marginalized. It was strongly against abortion and infanticide. It was revolutionary in their sexual ethics and marriage, and it was non-retaliatory, um, and it was marked by a commitment to love enemies and to forgiveness. So when we look at what the early church was all about, some of those issues, according to our culture, sound conservative. Some of those issues sound, according to our culture, liberal, but really it's just following Christ. And, and neither conservative nor liberal lately has been loving their enemies and forgiving people and um, non-retaliation. So with that in mind, um, there was one analogy that I shared that I actually got from Tony Evans about the football field. And you remember there's two teams. Those two teams are built specifically to beat each other. That is their goal. But on that field, there's a third team. And that third team doesn't have helmets on. That third team, when there's a football game, has stripes on and they are the referees. And the referees are on the field, but not of the field. They have a different set of rules. 
So therefore, when they make a call, it doesn't matter if the whole stadium boos or cheers. It doesn't matter if they like the guys that are on this team more than the guys on that team. If it's a penalty, it's a penalty. Or to take a baseball analogy, you have to be able to call balls and strikes no matter which team you would rather see win. So as Christians, God has called us to be like that third team. There's a, a third option. Um, then we went into some specific things, and we'll kind of open it up to some questions and answers. We, we talked about our bill of responsibilities. It's not even so much our bill of rights. It's our responsibilities. So we should elevate others greater than ourselves. Um, we should look at their preferences and put them before us. We should pray more than we pout, and we should have faith more than fear. So instead of crying about everything, um, if I pray more than I complain, I probably pray a lot more. <laughs> if I pray as much as I complain, I, I pray a lot. Uh, I think God wants us to pray more. And, and by complaining, I'm saying even complaining in my heart. Sometimes it doesn't come out of the mouth, but it's complaining in my head. Well, why can't I just during that time? Because the complaining is not going to change anything. But prayer will change my heart, and prayer could change a situation. Uh, we should have faith over fear. Um, we should see all life as sacred because God created life. From the womb to the tomb and everywhere in between, and every person is valuable, created in the image of God. We talked about we should have care for the poor and marginalized, and we should consider others. That the fact that you may be privileged, I may be privileged, does not equal evil. Someone, I'm privileged to be born in America. That, that blows me away. When, if you've traveled outside of the United States of America to developing nations that they don't have drinking water at times, and it's really difficult, and I realize I don't deserve this. I was just born. I was just born here. I didn't have anything to do with that. That doesn't make me evil, but what is important is what do I do with that privilege? What do I do with that responsibility? Uh, we also talked a little bit about critical theory and um, intersectionality. We looked at the sacredness of gender and ethnicity, how male and female created in the image of God and also in that ethnicity, these immutable characteristics, it, it's a mistake to judge people based on immutable characteristics. It's like, hey, you know what? I hate all people that are under 5'9". <laughs> you know, like, well, I was, I, there's nothing I could do about that, you know? And if we judge people based on something that they're just born with, these immutable characteristics, then we make a mistake. Um, Denise, would you mind turning the air a little bit cooler? I, I made it warmer earlier, and it's a little bit uh, getting warmer. Um, we talked about the sacredness of family and how family is important. Um, the downgrading today of mothers and fathers. And you know, if you're a single parent or you were born to a single parent home, we're not hating on single parents. My mom was an incredible, incredible single parent when my dad moved out when I was five. But even she would say that the important thing, like if you could have a mother and a father that are there together, there's a strength in that. But our world today is really degrading family, the church, and government. And these are the three institutions in God's word that he ordained. He ordained family, the church, and government. We talked about it's, it's important that the gospel is above the American dream, that we vote the truth but make sure our identity is rooted in Christ and not nationalism. It's okay to be patriotic, but when um, the, the dream becomes the main thing, then anyone that hinders me from getting to that dream becomes my enemy where God actually calls us to reach out to others and to help them. We talked about how character counts in candidates and in us, that we're to be humble and to read broadly and to th listen thoughtfully and to think biblically. If you only have one news source, then you're not getting the full story. And it doesn't matter what news source it is. It's really difficult to have just news today realize that news has adjectives. If it didn't have adjectives, it wouldn't sell and people wouldn't listen or watch. Instead of saying, you know, 
Um, President Trump had a speech on the garden of the White House today, and this is what he said. There's adjectives that are added. President Trump made an inflammatory speech on the, you know, and so inflammatory, that's an adjective that describes his speech where it's a judgment call. And someone else might say, President Trump made a very patriotic speech, and someone says, oh, that's, so do you see that? If it were just news, it would be boring. So news sells, and they get their money from revenue. They get their money from either you buying the source, watching it online, viewing it, reading it, have multiple news sources, um, read broadly, but think biblically, listen thoughtfully. And then finally, love everybody always. Whether they agree or disagree, God has called us to love. And then we gave out those commitment to unity cards um, that were to love our neighbors, were to honor, honor the image of God and all people, that Jesus, worship of Jesus as king is above every other alliance we're to receive biblical wisdom, use fruitful speech, try to be a peacemaker, and to love our enemies. So I wanted to review that just briefly because I wanted it to kind of sink in. The more that I hear things, the more that I start to get them a little bit, but also to kind of jog our memories and maybe some questions. Maybe there's some things that you're wondering about. Um, and I'll try to respond in a biblical way. I may not have all the answers, and might not, I might even have to research, and I might not even know, but I think these discussions are just helpful things. So if you're online on Facebook or on Zoom, um, if you could just put that in the comments, that would, be, that would be great. If you are here, then you could do that uh, live as well. And I, I could probably turn on my, I just realized, um, that we could do texting questions that I, I had forgotten to put that number up. Um, but it's 854-PRAY, so it's 831-ERA-CODE, 854-PRAY. So do you guys have any questions? Because what we'll do is we'll answer a few questions, and then we'll close with a, um, a scripture out of 1 Peter that I think will be very encouraging for us tonight, and then we'll worship. Any, any questions, online or here? No questions. <laughs> I have a question. All right. So how, how would you um, deal with uh, political issues within uh, your family? So you have a family member who strongly believes, you know, mm-hmm. one thing, and you strongly believe another thing, and the tension in the family. That's, that's, a great, that's a great question. So the question is, how do you deal with political tensions within a family when there's total disagreement? Is there anyone in here that doesn't have that situation going on in some place or another at home, or with, with some family members? Um, that's a great question. I think that the, the principle actually applies to more than political, but specifically we're talking about politics right now or a political view. Um, You know, James says, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I think that's the first way is to be quick to listen and to ask questions when a person says, this is my view. So I'm going to share, you know, these are the trigger phrases today. Um, If someone says, I just think that we should defund the police. And then before just, what, what do you mean? Like, wh- who are you gonna call? Like, you know, it, that's, I could so easily jump straight to the answer and go straight to wrath. I, in fact, I could be quick to wrath, slow to listen, slow to speak, or, or quick to speak. So I, I think that listening is a real big thing and say, what do you mean by that? Well, why do you say that? And don't just say it to be patronizing. It's really trying to understand where the person is coming from. Um, That, I think, is really huge because when they start to talk, as they're talking it through, sometimes, you know, they might say, well, I don't really mean defund. I just really, what I mean by that is I think there's some programs that need to be initiated. Well, what kind of programs? What do you mean by that? So you keep asking questions for the clarification and then when you find a common point, you could agree. And when you disagree, you could agree. I mean, you could disagree and do it in a quiet way without attacking the person. 
Now they might escalate, and there's the hard part, because I've been on this side of it where when someone else escalates, I could mirror their escalation, or vice versa, I could escalate, and then they could mirror, mirror me getting all bent out of shape. So um, it, it's amazing when you look at how many times people confronted Jesus about political things. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? He was just calm. He just gave very calm answers. He, uh, he's wiser than us, so that, that's helpful. Um, you know, get the coin. Whose image is on that coin? You know, give to Caesar uh, that which is Caesar's. But what was happening there, that was a political setup. The, there were zealots that were trying to get him to say, don't pay taxes to Caesar, because if you pay taxes to Caesar, then you are for Rome, not for the Jews. And there were other people that were saying, no, um, you know, don't pay taxes. And, and the other people said, well, then you're, you're disagreeing with government and God has set up authority. And so Jesus had this way of just cutting right through. So I think that there are times when we have to make a stand on what, what we believe. We also have to be okay with the other person not coming to the place of understanding things the way that we see it. And that's the hard part, especially when it seems so clear to you and someone doesn't agree, you can say, well, a- after asking those questions, then you can say, well, you know, I, I appreciate that. And you could talk about different points, but say, um, this is what I think about it. And then you could ask me some questions. And I think that that's a way, a, a way forward. Um, it hasn't been very modeled for us. I don't know how the debates went tonight, but the last debate, that was not, that was not how to do it. All right, so uh, let's see. We have a, another question here. Um, okay, this is a good one. What do you do? This is a great question. What do you do when both political candidates' character are questionable from a biblical perspective? Okay, so you have two candidates, and you're like, that candidate doesn't seem like Jesus. That candidate doesn't seem like Jesus. Uh, one of the things that Rob said in the video on Sunday, he said, unless Jesus is running for office, you will always be voting for the lesser of two evils. And and that's a part of it, unfortunately. There are times when you can get more excited about um, someone. They, they just seem like they might be more uh, Christ-like or might have more uh, biblical values of righteousness and justice. But there will be times when we have to make those decisions. One of the problems is that when we put the person up and we hold up the person as the example to follow, whenever we hold up the person that is running for office, like follow them and do everything that, you know, we, we set ourselves up because we're, as Christians, and by the way, I'm talking as, as a follower of Christ, so that would be different for someone that doesn't believe in Christ, but I look at it and realize that every person is gonna let us down. Imagine if you were in 1 Samuel, if you lived in those days in the Old Testament, and like, we want King Saul. We want King David. We want King Saul. Man, how do you want Saul? Saul's a jerk. Like, you know, <laughs> look how, how he does all these things. And David, he plays harp so nice. And, you know, he's just a, a good guy. But then you're following David. And all of a sudden, David commits adultery from, with someone in his cabinet, has that guy killed so that he could take that guy's wife And if you start defending David at that point and say, David is cool, David, no, he doesn't do anything wrong, you're just being a hater, we have to be able to call sin, sin. And and that means that we have to be able to do that, Um, we have to be able to call those things out within our own tribes and our own political parties. Um, Tribalism and, um, you know, when you have tribalism and you have partisanship, it means that you won't ever call out anything bad in anyone in your party. So if you're a Democrat, you, don't, you won't say anything wrong with any Democratic candidate. Or if you're a Republican, you won't say anything wrong with any uh, Republican candidate. So um, I think it's just speaking truth, but it is also, uh, yes, you will have to vote for the lesser of two evils because you know, we're gonna, they're going to fall short of that. So um, another one is... What does the Bible say about obeying government, Um, especially when they're asking things you don't agree with? Excellent, excellent question. In Romans 13, in fact, we could turn there. Let's turn to Romans 13, and we could see what the Bible says about obeying government. So 
So in Romans 13, it says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. As a Christian, it is very um, unhelpful to say about a president, not my president, and to say someone, that's your president. Because it's important to see this, that when Obama was the president, there were people that were saying, not my president. That's not my president. That's your president. And we can't make our way forward like that. So in Romans, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, when Paul is writing this, this is at a time when persecution of Christians is on the rise. To this day, we, you know, we're meeting here and we're not being dragged out of here. There's no one that is uh, beating us up, throwing us to lions, lighting us on fire. At the time when Paul is writing and persecution is on the rise, he's saying, let every soul be subject to governing authorities for there's no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So it's not like, well, I would obey, but I don't like the government. I don't like what they're saying. It says, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are a terror to good works, um, are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, then be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister to avenge, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil." the number one function of government in scripture is really enforcement of law, enforcement of good versus bad. Now, there are times that they don't, we're not to obey government. And those are times when it conflicts directly with what God says because there's a higher authority. Um, That's when you have martyrs. You have Christians around the world. Even to this day, there are more martyrs in 2020 and 2019 than there were in the first century. So this is happening right now all around our world. So how do we know? When do we disobey? In Acts chapter 5, it's interesting, where uh, Peter and John, they're they're put into custody. The Sanhedrin is there. Um, It's actually Acts chapter 4. And so they told Peter and John, not to speak anymore in Jesus' name. And it says in uh, Acts 4.18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people. So realize that Peter and John said, we have to obey God rather than men. So at times, yes, we have to break. Here's the tricky part. There will be different interpretations at times as to what that means. Let me give you the case in point in 2020. With churches that are being shut down to not be able to meet in person, and there are some pastors that have this conviction, some churches, some Christians that have the conviction um, that in Hebrews where it says, let us not forsake the gathering together of the brethren, which is our gathering for worship. So the government says, don't do that. And we feel like we need to obey the Lord. So we are going to meet. There's other Christians that love Jesus and that look at God's word and say, we can still meet, but we're meeting virtually for right now. And we're not doing it because we're trying to distance ourselves from one another, but we're trying to do it because we think that it's the safe thing to do. So case in point, if you hold up John MacArthur and you compare him to Andy Stanley, two totally different views on how to see those things. And it's important that um, in Romans, it says, who are you to judge another's servant? There are times when we may have disagreements over how to apply that scripture. So those are 
some of the, the sticking points. And if you could answer that one, then that's awesome. Because <laughs> as far as my, my conviction, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think all the government agencies and governors and government people are out to try to squash the church. I don't. I think that there are some that aren't Christians that are just trying to do the best that they can, and they're trying to figure it out, and even they are realizing we've missed, we've done some things wrong. There may be some that are trying to. There may be some that are really trying to, hey, let's, let's not let the church meet. But if we were treated differently, um, I know that people say, well, marijuana dispensaries are open, and I'm not advocating for that. Home Depot's open, bar, you know, there's all these other things. Essential services, you know, churches are an essential service. And what we do has so much of an impact on people's mental health, on relationships, on their souls, absolutely. So I am all for meeting safely. And to do that, you know, we've distanced things, we, you know, our air filtration system, all of those things that we're, we're trying to do. So, um, you know, when it comes to that persecution, again, from the government, uh, if, if they said basketball games, you guys could go ahead and, and play basketball and we'll have people in the stands, but churches you can't meet. Or if they said concerts, you guys could have concerts, but churches you cannot meet. If they said you can go to movie theaters and you can go see movies, but churches you cannot meet, I, I would feel differently. I'd be the first to civil disobedience. It's not civil disobedience. It's just obedience to a higher authority. And I would say that that would be you know, unjust. So good, good question. And again, um, that's just a perspective that I see from the word of God and other people may have other ones. Um, let's see. Another question. All right. As a disciple of Christ, I desire to be told the truth, but our news sources have been under scrutiny for producing fake news. What do I, as a follower of Christ, with both parties saying the news is fake, what do I do? Should I listen to the news at all? No. Don't listen to the news. <laughs> Turn off your phone. Don't read news. Like That one is a, a really difficult one. The only answer that I have for that is... Um, I think it is important to have multiple news sources from different points of view because even if I don't agree with another news source, I want to understand people and where they're coming from and the why. So instead of me judging people and saying, you guys, and that's what's happening right now in our world, um, this is a tangent that I, I, it's a little dangerous of a tangent because I don't want to go too far off, but I think it's relevant here. Um, there was a pastor's meeting where someone that was an officer of the, the CIA met with pastors and said, hey, I just want you guys to know, and this is probably back in February. This is before even COVID-19 really locked everything down, uh, that he was saying in the 2016 election, and, and this is public news, you could look it up, the Russians giving fake ads that are on Facebook and Twitter and different places, uh, this person was saying that 2020 is going to be worse, and it's multiple countries that are just trying to build confusion. So how do you decipher those things? I don't know. There's virologists on both sides. There's doctors on both sides of COVID-19. You could have different news sources. I say read broadly, um, listen, pray for wisdom, and then think biblically. But I'll tell you what causes me not to listen to someone if they take away my ability to choose or to think, if they tell me, you have to think this, if you don't think this, you're a lemming. If you don't think this, then you're a, a liberal. You are a right-wing fanatic. You are this, you are that. If any, anyone does that, or they say you're out of the group because you are researching other things, that's, that's kind of like, that's what happens with cults. Cults are saying, hey, you don't talk to anyone else about religion. You only talk to us. You only ask us. So if the Bible is true, if what I'm saying is true, then, man, you could check it out. You could go and you could research and you could ask any question that you want and, and there's something that is going to be solid to hold up to. So I, I think that that would be a part of it as well. And by multiple, I mean, yeah, read some sources that may be um, disagreeing with one another. And it, it creates more tension for sure, it's easier just to read everything that agrees with me. And um, 
I, I would also suggest read broadly and try to listen to different perspectives. Anyone that just starts to shut down thinking and say, you know, you're this and starts calling names, that just kind of loses respect for me. So um, maybe we'll take uh, just a couple more. Here's one. Um, how do you handle people giving their opinion harshly about presidents or governmental leaders? Um, many times people are judging me and they don't even know who I'm going to vote for. Hey, I absolutely sympathize with that because in, in our world today, there, there's so many broad brushes and I know what you're thinking. There are incredible mind readers today. <laughs> you see that in our culture. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're all about. I would just say when that happens, just give people grace and say, well, it, it's important that we give people grace. My, my mom, oh, I, I would get into it with my mom. My mom, it didn't matter who the president was. She just had this high view of authority where the president could do no wrong. And I would say, and it didn't matter who it was. Like when Clinton was president, mom, I don't like what he's doing. He's the president, Matthew, don't say anything. <laughs> when Bush is the president, mom, look what he's doing. Matthew, he's the president. <laughs> so I'm not saying that. I'm not saying like we, we are gonna have these blinders and everything the president says is good. But I think it's important that we have grace. And in our, in our world today, it, we're so harsh. It's actually one of the greatest hallmarks of, of the Christian is grace. If Jesus were as harsh with me as I am with others, or if Jesus is as harsh with us as we are with, with other people, uh, man, there's no hope. I mean, just listen to sports radio, the way people talk about others, um, actors, you know, people that are famous. That's why there's so much anxiety today. There's so much fear of what people are gonna say, so much fear of opinion. That's where being a Christian really helps us to find our identity in Christ. When Paul said, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, he knew what he was all about. Therefore, what people said about him really didn't affect him as much. It hurt him as a human being, but it, he wasn't going through all of those ups and downs and changing of opinion based on what other people were thinking. Um, to really know who we are in Christ means that we are more sinful than we ever could have imagined and we are more loved than we could have ever hoped. When we hold those things in tension and we realize someone else that might be in prison for something, I mean, without a show of hands, how many other people are in jail for something maybe that you've done that you just didn't, no one caught you, no one saw what you did? Um, and then you think about how in God's grace, man, he loves you so much and he doesn't make mistakes. And, and if you feel unloved or unlovable and you think, man, I have to clean up my act for God to love me more, um, I have good news for you. You just come as you are. It is the best news. It gives us such a sense of security and peace and love because he, he knew you would mess up. He knew you ahead of time and he still reaches out. He still loves us. So um, anything else? No other questions? No? All right. All right. Oh, we just got one more. We'll see. Should, um, let's see. Hold on a second. All right. Here's one more. As a Christian, should I side up with specific organizations at all, like pro-life, Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, or even my affiliation with denominations. Um, if, if you are voting, you're going to have to register some way. You're either going to have to register as an independent, a Republican, or a Democrat. So you do have to choose. You have to affiliate. It's just important when you affiliate. You know how they have, um, you know, like uh, Coke Zero or Coke Light and Pepsi Light. They have like... Um, uh, Tony Evans talked about like when there used to be uh, Budweiser and Bud Light. Do you remember the Super Bowl commercials, Bud versus Bud Light? He's like, you could be Democrat, but you be, better be Democrat light. And if you, you could be Republican, but you better be Republican light. 
And what that means is that your, and this comes back to our theme for One Kingdom Indivisible, it's kingdom allegiance above every other alliance. So if I am, here's an example in point, um, as a teacher, uh, the teacher's union. So there was the teacher's union, uh, the California Teachers Association that you're automatically in as a teacher, but then we had our local chapter as well, and I had to decide whether or not to join the local chapter. And so the union teachers were coming to me and they were very strong saying, you better join the union because we're gonna back you. And then I would talk to some other people and they're saying, don't join the union because then, it, you know. And so I had to look at what did that chapter stand for? What were they all about? Who were those people? What were their values? And so when, whether it would be a union or Republican versus Democrat, and even as an American, my citizenship in heaven is above my citizenship on earth. And as patriotic and as much as I love this, this country, um, there's gonna be times that we have to say, hey, I'm gonna follow God rather than that organization. So it's okay to, to um, be a part of a group, a denomination, an affiliation, but if the values of that group are antithetical to the values of the kingdom of God and to Christ, then that's when I have to break with that group. And then you have to make that decision, do I stay in the group and try to change things or do I, I leave? I've had friends that have a, I had a friend that tried to stay at the church that he was at to try to change things from within and he tried for a long time and then he absolutely couldn't and they, they forced him out. So he stayed as long as he could. Those are, those are Holy Spirit led things where you have to pray, am I supposed to stay here to try to make things better, or am I, is it better if I go elsewhere? So, man, thank you guys. These are great, great questions. I hope and pray that some of this has been helpful. I hope and pray that this has been edifying. So tonight, I want to leave you with this scripture out of 1 Peter, and then uh, we'll just uh, worship Jesus because... We do have one question from Facebook. Oh, what's the question there? Why is pro-choice wrong? Great question. Why is pro-choice wrong? By pro-choice, um, I want to define terms because so many people have different terms for different things. By pro-choice, what I'm talking about um, when I address the question is those that say abortion on demand is okay because of the right of the woman and her autonomy. Um, all of us have agency and all of us have autonomy but when it comes to life, when we read in the book of Jeremiah, it says, um, Jeremiah is praying to God, and he says, you have knit me, you, before, when I was in my, other, my mother's womb, you knew me. Uh, Psalm 139 says, I was knit together, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, again, from the womb. So life um, starts, and if God is the author of life, and that's life in every stage, um, that's why it's important that when it comes to the sanctity of life, and by sanctity we mean the holiness, the sacredness of life, um, I, I really believe that when it comes to life, we, we're not the ones to take um, that life. So that's, that's why I think pro-choice uh, would, be, would be wrong. Now, I, I understand the different um, arguments as well. So you think about um, size. You, they could say, well, you know, it's just a, it's just the baby is so small at that point, you know, and they'll, they'll say a fetus, you know, and techn it's a technical term, but, you know, someone else will say, well, it, it's a baby. But if size were the issue, then, you know, infants aren't worth less than adults. Now, you could say, oh, that's a straw man argument. That's really stupid. You're setting up this stupid argument so you can knock it down. But actually, in the ancient world, that's how it was. And that's why one of the characteristics of the early church, it was very pro-life, the sanctity of life at all the phases because children were kind of throwaways, especially infants. And if an infant, if a family would have a child and they wouldn't be able to have the child, like uh, to raise it with money, then it would be okay if that child died. So we see the sacredness of life in every phase. And I think that goes into other places as well. Um, it, it also goes into, you know, where... Where is that child? If that child is in the womb of the mother, I, I really believe that one of the tragedies is 
the church in the past, and I think that the church, by church I mean capital C, the larger worldwide church, at least in America, has really come a long way in having compassion for women um, that get pregnant, that don't want to keep the baby, but are willing to give it up for adoption. I, I think, again, it goes back to grace. Because of the legalism and the judgmentalism and the harshness of churches um, in the past, many women that would get pregnant would try to hide that and would try, um, because they'd be ostracized and looked down upon. And I think when we surround those people with love and, and say, hey, we'll help, and there's foster parenting, like Foster the Bay, which uh, you know, we're, we're talking about and supporting and, and um, adoption and those things, I think it's to come alongside of that person because when we see life valuable at every stage, I think that we also see uh, people with um, disabilities, like Down syndrome, uh, people that have different um, physical ailments, and then the elderly as well. So pro-life is not just saying, hey, um, it's all about abortion. It's life in all of its stages. And so we should affirm that, um, especially because Jesus describes himself as life. You know, uh, he, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And um, death is something where it, it's always going to be an intruder. We deal with death. And the other thing is that when a woman has an abortion, it's important to show grace and love and mercy and to come alongside of that person. Again, because of so much guilt and condemnation that the church has shown in the past, that's, that's a bad mark on, on the church in many ways in the past. And um, still a lot of ways like that, but hopefully we're, we're getting better. So that's a short answer. Um, if, if you want more, I, I would say that that's, um, that's cold wisdom in a sense by just giving the answer. But if I were to, if, if that is you and you're in that situation or someone else is in that situation, Man, it is so important to love them, to come alongside of them, to, to listen, to empathize, and to know every person has a story. Uh, one thing that Deanna says is that we're always one piece of information away from compassion. And um, yeah, it's important not to look at it as, sometimes we look at things as issues instead of looking at people. Like, it's not just an issue, that's a person, and those are real, real people. So, um, let's pray. Uh, I know that there's a lot more. Thanks for the questions, by the way. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I, w I would like to, because we're gonna stop chur um, Life Church on Wednesday evenings, we may have some more of these periodically where it's a lot more interactive through Zoom. So there would be a Zoom where it's um, people can talk and there's kind of like a back and forth conversation. We, we definitely would like to do that a lot more. So thank you for that. Father, tonight we thank you for your word. Um, Lord, the scripture that comes to mind that I wanted to share tonight was um, just to be reminded that we are to be ready with an answer to every person for the hope that is within us. So Lord, tonight we sanctify you, Lord, as God in our hearts Help us to be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that's in us, but with meekness and with reverence. Father, help us to have a good conscience that when people defame us as evildoers, those who revile our good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, for it is better for us um, and the will of God to suffer for doing good rather than doing evil. Lord, help us to love our enemies even when there's disagreements and um, God, give us boldness, give us courage, give us love. God, we desperately, our world desperately needs hope. You've given us that hope, so help us to be able to share that hope, the reason that we have hope. Um, tonight, Lord, we, we pray uh, for however the vice presidential debates went. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of fighting, a lot of noise. God, as, as your people, help us to listen. Help us, to, um, help us to have a love for people that you have. Jesus, you came even for your enemies. Even when they were crucifying you, you said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And there are so many people in this world right now that don't know what they're doing. 
Lord, that when they attack and when they're angry, Lord, help us to help us to see that there may be a reason behind it. And God, we ask that you would save many, that you would draw many to yourself. Help us to speak truth, to be bold in that, but not to be obnoxious. God, help us to be humble before you um, because, Lord, we all sit in that place of undeserved grace. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.